Okay, friends, have a little seat. Good morning again, church. It's just about still the morning. I want to begin by blessing you. I just want to pray a blessing over you right now as we start. So I bless you in the name of Jesus to know him more wonderfully today. I bless you in the name of Jesus to be healed in your body, your mind, your heart, your soul, wherever you need it today. I bless you to have peace and joy no matter what you are facing and to know God's realness, his goodness, and his victory in everything. Amen. If I asked you, what do you treasure? What is deeply precious to you? I wonder what comes to mind. When we treasure something, we cherish it, we protect it, we would choose it above other things, we might even be transformed by it. Obvious negative example, Gollum and the ring. We all know what happens there. Uh, more positive example, my father. So, my dad has a vast and growing collection of miniature soldiers, tanks, and airplanes. They are lovingly arranged in his study. He clears shelf space for them. I think he probably builds new shelves for them. He goes in and he looks at them, he rearranges them, he builds them, he paints them, he plans to pass them down to the next generations in our family. He treasures them, but he doesn't treasure them like in a vacuum or in isolation. He treasures them because in his heart, he loves everything to do with World War II. And over the years, I've known my father, his love for that part of history has not faded or diminished with time. If anything, it has intensified over the years. And although he's not been transformed to any golem type level just yet, thank goodness, he has been known to spontaneously march or stand to attention. As humans, we have an amazing capacity to love, and to, out of that love then to treasure what is dearest to us. And we see examples around us all the time of how if we truly treasure something, that can endure through time, through trial, even through loss. The loves we fuel in our life grow, and to treasure something is to essentially fuel that fire. Jesus says in Matthew 6, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. What we treasure and what we desire, we know and we experience in our lives, these are so closely interlinked, they're almost indistinguishable. And thankfully, what we choose to treasure has the power to transform our heart, to transform our desires, so that we are increasingly satisfied in God I'm going to call this our mini treasure series over the next few weeks, not because we're going to find mini, mini treasure, though that would be fun, but because it's a mini series and it's about what we treasure. And Sean has set us up so well last week in talking about the true value of the Holy Spirit, the true value of who we have been given in the Holy Spirit. I was planning to start a series today on hearing God's voice, but in an attempt to practice what I preach, I opened up the Bible this week, I opened it up in Romans, and I could not get past the gospel. The Romans opens with Paul saying, I have been sent to preach the good news. God promised this good news long ago. The good news is about his son. It feels fitting that before we think about treasuring the voice of God, before we think about treasuring the word of God, before we think about treasuring anything that God gives us, that we would begin here by treasuring the gospel, the good news, the story that as Christians we build our lives on. And I'll start with a confession. Sometimes I feel intimidated by the simple gospel the simple gospel. I see guys on Facebook and they talk about preaching the simple gospel. Or I've been in settings where someone has got up and taught about the simple gospel for like an hour and a half. Or I started a podcast on the simple gospel, but it was like eight parts long and each part had a different title and each part was about an hour and a half long. I get what people mean when they say the simple gospel. I think they mostly mean it is what it is. We don't need to add to it. We don't need to fluff it up. It works as it is, and that is good, and that is right. But I know for me, I'm also like, okay, in that sense, it is simple, but it's also mysterious and wonderful and sublime. I get it, and yet I also can't get my head around it. One God, 
three in one, Father, Spirit, Son. Even if we went no further, I'm like, okay, already sublime and beyond my understanding. God, the Son, sent by God the Father, becomes human, dies a death that for us now is quite far removed by time and place and location and culture. God, the Father, raises him from the dead. And we are told in the Bible that what happened there means that we can have a new identity and we can have new life. And this new life is a saved life. It's the fullness of life, as the Bible describes it, abundant life. We can have healing. We can have freedom through Jesus. And this new identity is a shift in identity from being enemies of God through sin and through our brokenness to being friends with God, family of God, called righteous. Justification, meaning we're justified, we're called right in God's eyes, where once we were not all right in his eyes. We're called right in his eyes. That justification then leads to sanctification, which is the Holy Spirit being sent to transform us, which then leads to glorification, which is when one day we'll share in the glory and reward of Jesus in its fullness. And that's if you start with Jesus coming to the earth. If you start at the start of the Bible and trace the whole thing through, you can tell the story of the gospel from the very beginning to the end as God restores his people to himself who he made and then he is with again for eternity. You could talk about the gospel Jesus preached, the gospel of the kingdom of God drawing near. I've seen people use their hand to share the gospel and the five-finger gospel. I've seen people use little beads on a bracelet, different colored beads to share the gospel. I've seen people use little books. I've seen that one drama that was circulating in the early 2000s used to share the gospel. And in summary, the gospel is simple in that it is true and it has power to save, but it is also sublime so sublime that our first step in treasuring it isn't probably to reduce it down to something that I can perfectly understand and I can perfectly communicate, but to take the whole wonderful message of God we find in Scripture and to open it up and to marvel at it for the rest of our lives. And yet, we know that we're not here, I'm not here on this earth simply to marvel at the gospel but God says we're to be messengers of the gospel. Romans 10 says this, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on Jesus' name will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. I think I sometimes understand my role as a messenger as if I'm a postman. It's like, I'm a messenger, I have the gospel, I will be given my route, you will be given your route. Together, we'll cover it all. Maybe I'll have a cat, boom. I feel like God reminded me this week that when it comes to the gospel, I am to think of myself less like a postman who wants me to be a letter. In 2 Corinthians 3, Paul writes to the church, he says, clearly you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is not written with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. For Paul, the proof of his true gospel message was literally written on the people who had received it because they'd been transformed by the spirit of God. The gospel, according to 1 Corinthians, is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. The first way we will treasure the gospel is not by wrapping it up in a bow and succinctly passing it on, but opening it up and letting all of it transform all of us by the Spirit of God. When you read through Paul's letters in the New Testament, when we read through those letters, we see that so often Paul structures them with theology and then application. He'll be like, here's who God is. Here's what God has done for you. Here's what it means for your life. Therefore, stop fighting. (laughs) Forgive this person. Be better at this thing. I sometimes wonder if I zoomed out and I put on like a Pauline pastor hat and looked at my own life, what sort of letter would I write myself? I would probably be a little bit more like, Laura, like get a grip. Be more patient. Be less fearful. Be nicer to that person. Come on. Why is God's way is so often to call us back to the truth of the gospel We struggle with fear. The solution for me is not be more brave. It's receive again the perfect love of Jesus that will deal with that fear. We're impatient. The Holy Spirit is just longing for an opportunity to remind us about the patience of God in saving us and coming for us. We can't deal with a person 
We could grit our teeth and bear it in our own strength, or we could ask the Holy Spirit to reveal his heart for that person, why Jesus came to die for them. The Holy Spirit might, yes, probably will highlight like specific behaviors and patterns and thoughts in our life, but not just to deal with that one thing in isolation, but so that we can be led back into the truth, so that we can be led back into the fullness of freedom in Jesus. Treasuring the gospel looks like being personally transformed by the gospel first and foremost, and yet we will not tick this off. This will be the journey of our lives, and if we think we're done, we're probably not done. But good news, like Sean shared last week, this is not something we do in our own strength. Letters do not write themselves. If we're willing, the Holy Spirit will do this in us. And then as we become letters rather than postmen, post people, what can we do to treasure the gospel? Or what about the gospel do we want to treasure today? First thing I want to treasure about the gospel, and I'll apologize to Jonathan on screens, it's basically the same as what you have, but there's been a little bit of, you can just flow with it. Um, I think it'll be okay. I meant to say to you, the gospel is good news because it is gloriously specific. The book of Mark opens with this line. It says, this is the good news, the gospel about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. We've heard about that in the Mark series. Mark's use of the word good news was culturally familiar. It had connotations of something new, but it mostly meant more of the same. It meant imperial power and rule. It would have been used to announce a new emperor, the birth of a new emperor, or the start of a new regime. People hearing that sort of good news were expected, demanded to respond by celebrating, complying, and spreading the word of it. Not out of choice, but out of fear-based social duty. Everything about Mark's gospel, though, when he presents the gospel of Jesus Christ, everything in his gospel is about Jesus, a better king, a different king with a different sort of power to save and to heal and to transform lives. We live in a world of information overload, and not just information, but conflicting information. Tech is exploding. AI is both a genius and not. ChatGPT can plan for me a personalized itinerary for a city I've never been to, and yet cannot tell me how many digestive biscuits I need to feed 30 people s'mores on the Isle of Uist. Who can we trust? Apps like TikTok have made us scrollers, we're bombarded with all of this bite-sized religion, spirituality, opinion, music, dancing, self-help, throw in ever-shifting values and cultural norms about what is right. It's no, it's no wonder that we live in an atmosphere of confusion and anxiety. And in this context, people are longing, increasingly longing for something authentic and true. And we're all around us, we have brokenness, like stacking up on top of brokenness because no generation has found yet a political solution or a social solution or a progress-based solution that will actually deal with our fear and our hopelessness and our shame and our neediness deep at the root of us. In that context, we present the same gospel that has been preached for thousands of years the same gospel that many, many people every day are responding in faith to say, yes, I believe. And they're seeing their lives transformed and the lives around them transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit in them. It's a good time to treasure the specific dimensions of the gospel of Jesus Christ. One person who really lived, Jesus of Nazareth. One historic event, death on a Roman cross. And one question, did this man who claimed to be God really rise from the dead? Jesus Christ Superstar is a musical by Andrew Lloyd Webber, and it ends with Jesus' crucifixion. It just ends there. Apparently, in an attempt to emphasize his humanity and to allow for an openness of interpretation, but the gospel and history point to one reality that Jesus wasn't just another fake Messiah squashed by Roman forces and that he's not just another God to add to a collection, but actually raised from death to life. He's king of all kings and Lord of all lords. And where the Roman gospel of good news demanded a response from people, the gospel of Jesus calls for one, faith first, heart first. The gospel is good news because it's not about me. 
and what I can do. I asked ChatGBT, my friend, uh, to tell me how five other belief systems understand salvation and closeness to God. And common threads were, among all of them, a need to follow specific practices, a need for special spiritual knowledge, a need for right living, however it was defined, a future day where our deeds would be weighed and salvation granted or not, and then closeness to God in the meantime was coming through submission and obedience. In all these other belief systems, strip it all away and you've got a God with scales. Or you've got no God, but you've still got scales. Am I good enough to tip the scales in my favor? Am I doing enough good to tip the scales in my favor and be worthy in the eyes of this God or in the eyes of the people around me? This is not good news for the normal person. If you're an amazing person, maybe you have a little bit of hope that someday it'll go okay for you, but if you're a regular, flawed person, that kind of life brings no certain hope. But the Bible says your deeds will never save you. That if there's some sort of heavenly seesaw, you are stuck on the ground. And there aren't scales, but if there were, you would never tip them. So instead, God came to get you. And this is good news. But don't we know that sometimes it takes humility to set down our scales and say, I need a savior? We will only treasure a gospel that saves us if we know that we need saving. In Luke chapter 7, there's a story where we see a sinful woman, as she's called in the narrative. She cries over Jesus' feet as she anoints him with oil. And the disciples, so like Jesus' friends, his followers are there, and they're like watching what's happening and thinking and saying isn't it a bit much? And Jesus tells them it's because she has been forgiven much that she loves much. The truth is we are all the sinful woman. We've all been forgiven much. But for many of us, it's so familiar to hear that or our lives are so fine that actually the reality of what God has done for us washes right over us and we end up looking at others thinking, isn't it a bit much? If I drank water from my kitchen tap for years and it tasted like good Scottish council juice tap water, refreshed me, quenched my thirst, did the job. If I was drinking my water for years and years and then someone came to me and was like, look, actually, um, that water should have poisoned you, but 2,000 years ago, uh, Jesus did something that means that actually it's not poisonous anymore, so you're fine. I'd probably be like, Okay, great, like, thanks for letting me know that, but yeah, no, feel fine, being fine, that's all right. Whereas if I drank water from my tap and I was poisoned by it, and I got sicker and sicker and could feel the pain increasing, and I was like, I think death is approaching for me, and then Jesus came into my kitchen and gave me an antidote and healed me and made me well, I would know what he had done for me. For some of you, that's what it felt like to come to know Jesus. But the truth is, for all of us, sin is not some far-off problem that Jesus dealt with 2,000 years ago. Without Jesus, sin would be my greatest problem today. My heart turned from the God who made me would be my greatest problem today. And it would mean that I could not come close to him. We will never know what it felt like to be God's people before Jesus to feel the weight of the animal that we had to bring to give to a priest to sacrifice on our behalf, to smell the blood, to see the mess. We will never know what it felt like to live in that rhythm of sacrifices for sin, to have such a broken system that it was the only one we had and yet we're clinging to the promise of a savior to come. We won't know exactly what that felt like, but for early Christians, Jews who had become Christians, they knew all too well the history of that, that that was their story. They knew that sin was a problem. They knew that they'd been separated from a holy God. And in the book of Hebrews, the author is reminding these early Jewish Christians of the new treasure that they have in Jesus, saying, yes, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place by the blood of Jesus. This was a radically new reality, and they would have known it. In Exodus, God's people are in the wilderness and God is going to come down the mountain to meet with them. Before he comes, he says to Moses, mark off a boundary all around the mountain. Warn this people, be careful. Do not go up on the mountain or even touch its boundaries. 
Anyone who touches the mountain will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the person or animal that crosses the boundary. Instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. They must be put to death. This was just part of the old reality of an unholy people and a holy God. And the most holy place was a small section of the tabernacle where not just anyone could go, but the high priest could go one time, once a year, and not empty-handed, but in fear and trembling with a sacrifice to see if God would grant them another year and forgive their sins. Jewish Christians, when receiving the book of Hebrews, facing intensifying persecution, were being told, your like, outer life, your life might look like utter garbage. Like you're struggling, you're suffering, and yet your new reality with God is glorious because of the gospel. It's not just someday you'll be allowed into the outskirts of heaven, but it's right now in a spiritual and real sense, you can come right into the presence of God, as close as it's possible to be, as close as you can imagine being or language can describe you being, right in. It's not the same way as before. You don't need to bring a sacrifice. You can come in empty-handed as you are because of what Jesus has done for you. Nikki Gumbel tells a story in one of the Alpha videos of a child running into a palace about a little boy just opening the door and running in and to the shock of the guards, like passing them and going through the hallways and the ornate dining rooms and to everyone's shock and horror, eventually ending up at the king's bedroom and going into the king's bedroom and even under the king's bed. And then he says, this child was the king's son. And that is why he had the access that he had. The good news of the gospel is that we're not saved by the skin of our teeth. But actually, it's a story about a God who longs to be our father, wants us to be his children. So sent Jesus so we could be adopted into his family now and for eternity. The gospel is good news of a new reality for us. I remember being at Westlife concerts when I was younger, and yes, my people, you know who Westlife are. Tick. Irish boy band, really, really good. Look them up on YouTube later. Um, I remember being at Westlife concerts when I was younger and being like miles away from the stage. Um, thank you, Mum, for those tickets. And just happy to be there. Just happy to be there. Happy to be breathing the same air as them. In our joys and in our sorrows of life, in the mundane moments of life, I wonder if we ever treat God the same way. Like what I would have been given at one of those concerts to be given a full access pass. What I would not have traded to have been given access, like backstage access to see them, to know where they were, to be like right up next to them. I would have given anything, but I did not have access. But we do have access. The good news of the gospel is that we've gone from having no access to having full access on our good days, on our bad days, everything in between. Romans says, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. And that privilege isn't like earthly privilege. It's not glorious house, beautiful family, everything perfect for you. No, that undeserved privilege is talking about your proximity to the God of the universe because of the gospel. And in Hebrews, we hear of this amazing access to God, and then the very next chapter goes into what is sometimes called the hall of faith, where it talks about these amazing men and women who lived by faith, not by sight. So everything in their lives, their decisions in their lives, what they did in their lives, they were looking with spiritual eyes, and they were walking in obedience to God, and they lived these amazing lives, like almost impossible seeming lives of faith. But what will precede and what will underpin an amazing life of faith, if we wanna have one, a deep inner life with God because of the gospel. So what's the TLDR of my message today? Too long, didn't read. One, it's to treasure the gospel. We must be first and always people transformed and being transformed by the truth of the gospel. And second, it's that sharing the gospel is letters rather than post people. We share and we can treasure it because it is gloriously specific. It's not about what I can do, and it brings us into a new reality of undeserved privilege. And finally, how do we respond to the gospel? The right response is humility and worship, according to the book of Romans. 
In Romans, there's a ragtag bunch of an early church, mix of Jews and Gentiles who've come to know Jesus, struggling to get on. And they are being invited to respond to the gospel with humility, to stop judging each other for their differences, to stop being pit against each other, and to unify around the wonderful message that had changed their lives. And I think there's a similar invitation for the church in 2024. Can we let the goodness of the gospel and its sub- simplicity and its sublimeness unify us, our one message of hope that we stand on? Can we let that dismantle our pride, transform how we see each other, how we love each other? And then a second response we see in Romans is true worship. Paul starts in chapter one and he connects like humanity's sinfulness to basically a failure to worship rightly, like that we worshiped created things rather than the creator. And that's at the very heart of our brokenness. And then in chapter 12, when he's expounded this amazing gospel and what God has done for us through Jesus, then he calls the church to true worship, which he defines as giving your life, giving your body as a living sacrifice in response to what God has done for you. We're going to see that enacted in baptism today. To say, I will let my old self die and stay dead, and I will enter into new life with you, Jesus, because of what you've done, a transformed life. A worthy response to the gospel isn't going to be a life of avoiding sin in our own strength or exploiting grace. It's better than that. It's a life of humility. It's a life of worship and submission to God as he transforms us. Now, as I finish, uh, this was not a message on how to share the gospel, But I do have just a couple of thoughts um, that came to mind this week. And first, I guess, is more of a question. What would it look like for you to be a letter of the gospel in your sphere of influence? And by that, I mean for you to be so radically transformed by the truth of the gospel that you contextualize it, like you make it real for the people in your world. And that's not to be a cop-out of sharing it with words and speaking about who Jesus is, because we need to do that, but it's more to embrace the fullness of the transformation work that God wants to do in your life and to believe in where he's put you. How could the gospel transform your relationships? How you date, how you talk about other people, how you lead your family, how you run your business, your study plan, your schedule, your time, your goals, It's an invitation to look at the areas of our life again and say, Lord, help me see in what ways do these not reflect the truth of the gospel, and then don't make a list of to-dos to fix it, but ask the Holy Spirit to bring you back to the truth and to transform you by it. And the second thing is, uh, I think of a lady I know called Karen Sheffers, and it's funny because today one of my Canadian friends is here who also knows Karen and loves her. But Karen used to be a speaker at Rookie Camp. She probably still is, this camp for just tiny little children in Canada. And she did this thing that I'll just never forget that she did, where she had a lunchbox, and she would let these children, three to five years old, put anything they want in the lunchbox. Already, parents in the room were like, goodness me, what did they put in the lunchbox? But she would let them put anything in the lunchbox. And then when she opened it, not having seen what they put in, she would tell them something about Jesus through what they'd put in the lunchbox. I want to treasure what God has done for me to the point that no matter what the great lunchbox of life gives me, I can talk about the goodness of God. Fear, here's Jesus. Shame, here's Jesus. Bad day at work, here's Jesus. Nightmares, here's Jesus. People wounds, here's Jesus. Best day of your life, here's Jesus. I have a couple of challenges for us today. And then I just want to lead us in a time of prayer. First one is, this is all just really simple and yet also really big. Uh, Open your heart to receive and treasure the gospel for yourself today. And then secondly, to give God an area of your life that needs to be transformed by it. Maybe there's something that for you, you're like, yeah, this, it's almost as if the truth of who God is hasn't touched this area of my life. And I would just encourage you that Jesus came to save the whole of you, to give you fullness of life. I want to pray for us just now. I pray, Holy Spirit, come, speak to us, help us, even now. Come by your Spirit, Lord. God, I pray that all of us would know that you are here, that you are real, that you love us. And just a couple of different things as I was 
praying this morning, I, I want to make space for. I want to make space for if you believe in Jesus, but you have not given God your life in humility and worship yet. Like if, you're, if you've come to a point where you're like, I believe in this, but you've not said to God, like you can have me, you can have my life. I think you might want to respond in a little second. I wonder if some of us are feeling like, okay, I've not treasured the gospel. I've actually been like ashamed or awkward. I've felt, I've wanted to kind of distance myself from this message, not actually embrace it and love it and treasure it. And then thirdly, I wonder if some of us have grown cold or it's so familiar or we're so fine that we've grown cold to this. I just want to pray for us. So firstly, if you're someone and you're like, I believe in this, but I've not given my life to Jesus yet. I've not let him be Lord and King of my life. God, I pray for anyone right now who feels that way, who believes in you. And Lord, I pray, would you give them boldness? Would you make them ready? Would they know your love? Would they know your goodness? And God, would you give them the courage today to say, Jesus, you can have it all. You can have my life. Forgive me, make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I give my life to you. And God, for any of us here who maybe we're like, no, I've not treasured it, and we're like anywhere on that spectrum from being like totally ashamed of it to just not treasuring it as we know and now feel that we should by your Spirit in this place. God, we repent. We turn back to you, Jesus. And we just pray, come, heal our heart. Transform our mind. And help us to treasure the gospel, to treasure you, Jesus, and what you've done as we should. And then finally, if you have grown cold, to any degree, I pray, Lord Jesus, would you awaken our hearts? Would you revive our hearts, God? Start with us. Your people in this place, Lord, start with us. Would we be awake and alive to the gospel? Would we know, Jesus, that we have been forgiven much? And would we love much in return? God, for all of this and all that you're doing, I bless you and I thank you and I pray um, as we go into a time of baptism just in a while, Lord, remind us, even as we see the physical reminder of what it is to give our lives to you, to walk into life with you, God, would you uh, pierce our hearts again, awaken our hearts to the reality of the gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.